Excellent, thank you. My name is Laura Gibbons, and I want to thank you for coming here today to greet our visiting artist, Sarah Williams. Um, before I talk about where Sarah's coming from, I want to make sure to thank the whole drawing and painting faculty for all of their work, collaborating with me to put this event together. I really appreciate it, and I think we've had a great experience putting all our classes together. So thank you so much for working with me on this. Um, I think I mentioned my name's Laura Gibbons. I teach in printmaking, but I've always had a close relationship with drawing and painting and have the utmost respect for what draw draftsmen and painters do. Um, therefore, I got to meet Sarah, Sarah Williams during her time here at UNT. She's an alumna of our program and graduated from the University of North Texas with her MFA in 2009. Before that, she received her BFA from William Woods University in Fulton, Missouri. Her oil paintings have been shown in galleries and museums in locations including New York, Houston, Dallas, Los Angeles, and San Francisco. Williams has participated in artist residency programs, which are a great thing to do, by the way. She's gonna have lots of professional tips for all of us. She's participated in residency programs such as Willapa Bay Artists in Residency, Malay Colony for the Arts, highly prestigious, the studios of Key West Residency Program, U, U Cross Foundation Residency Program, and Vermont Studio Center. This is basically a list of every place you should try to apply for. These are all great places. She is currently an associate professor of painting and drawing at Missouri State University in Springfield. And so with that, I'd like to welcome Sarah Williams. Thank you so much for spending time with us today. Of course. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> And um, Sarah is going to be presenting from the back so we can click her slides. Yes. <laughs> but first, I really would like to say, Laurie, thank you so much for inviting me. Matt, thank you so much for having me with your students, talking to the grads. It's just amazing to be back here. I can honestly say that my decision to come to UNT and being accepted here was probably one of the best ones I've made in my life. The mentorship that I received, the friendships that I made was just profound for me. So there's no way I can stand up here and say thank you to all the, the people that helped me along the way, but please just know that you made all the difference for me. And you all are so lucky to have access to them too, so I hope that you're getting every little bit out of it that you possibly can. So thank you, thank you, thank you. Uh, I, I will be talking from the back of the room, you know, just so I can kind of control the slides, but if you, in, anyway, has any questions along the way, you're more than welcome to like raise your hand and I'll, I'll stop and answer them. Thank you, Laurie, for the introduction. I am a, a professor of painting and drawing at Missouri State University in Springfield. This is actually my 10th year working there. Uh, I run the MFA program as well, so there's a lot of, of things going on around campus. But I thought what I would do today is tell you about my work, but also tell you about the path that I took to get here um, and offer some ideas about you know, timing, professionalism, some of the things I hope are on your radar along the way. So I'm an oil painter. Uh, I'm interested in using structures as kind of a surrogate for the specific area and region, the country where I grew up, which is the rural Midwest. Um, like many small towns, my hometown is currently struggling in it, with its economy and it exists in kind of what is known as a flyover territory. You know, in the Midwest, a lot of times um, there's not a big draw like there would be to a city like New York City, LA, or, or Houston. But being from there, I have an incredible sense of pride about my hometown. So I try to make work that sort of elevates the mundanity of some of the life there and some of the imagery that's there. And that's why I've chosen to do it as a nocturne, because with that kind of uh, lighting and atmosphere, I think it kind of elevates uh, the subject matter and makes the insignificant feel more significant, sort of cinematic in, in quality. So my home has always been grounding to me. Um, when I moved to Denton to pursue my master's, I was really thrown for a loop. They, I mean, it's exponentially larger than my hometown. I was in a time when I didn't know anything at all. Uh, and so it really took that move for me to realize what I cared the most about and what I knew the most about. So today I'm going to talk to you about that, the different steps that I took, the progressions that I've had. 
um, give you a chance to ask questions. Uh, we'll go from there, though. So my hometown, Brookfield, Missouri. Is anybody from Missouri in this room? Oh, yeah, that's right, yeah. Has anybody been to Missouri? All right, yeah, so you know. So I, I currently live uh, in the southern part of the state. That's where Missouri State University is. It's in the Ozarks. So I'm sure probably some of you have seen the show Ozarks. Uh, yeah. So some of that rings true, but it's a beautiful part of the country. I love it. I'm really proud of it. Um, I grew up in the north end of the state. The population of my hometown was just over you know, 4,000 people, but we were the metropolitan area of the state. We had the only grocery store in a 30-mile radius. Um, so that's kind of where I grew up. It was very, very small. There wasn't really anyone in the arts when I was growing up, anybody that could ask questions of or, or look to for advice. Uh, really the only kind of art I had access to were people's calendars, you know, or coffee mugs, um, which is kind of sad, but that's just, that's where I was. Um, and the closest art museum was like three hours away, you know, in Kansas City. And so it was challenging to get back and forth and seeing those kinds of things. I went to school at William Woods University, like Laurie mentioned. I actually went on a golf scholarship. So that was the way that I was able to put myself through undergrad. And I think that it actually gave me a lot of really excellent um, skill sets for being an artist. So I'm a golfer, I love it. I find a lot of similarities between the art making process and golf. Um, I still play it today, it's one of my favorite hobbies. But as a student athlete, we had a split season. So we played in the spring and the fall, and it was not uncommon for us to be out of town three days of the week, Sunday, Monday, Tuesday. And you know, as an art student, that's incredibly challenging because you have to be in the studio, you have to be making, you have to have access to the models and to the still lives. So I really got good at managing my time and being organized and having a solid work ethic. And you know, as an art student, those are really, really important. Um, so I, I really credit golf for that. When I was an undergrad, uh, it was a really formal, uh, small program. So that's where I learned to oil paint. I'd never used oils before that. Um, my, uh, my high school experience was woefully underfunded as an art program. I still remember those big jugs of like tempera paints and everybody can probably has a sense of that smell and the color of the green that they had, but that was all we had. Uh, so I got to college and I learned a lot about you know, color theory, compositions, using oil paints, um, just a fa solid foundation. There wasn't much focus on the conceptual end, uh, so I knew that was a weakness for me. I just hadn't had much experience with it. This was the work I was making as a senior. I had a whole body of work that uh, I had done set up at the local Walmart. I set up like a plein air easel and I would paint from direct observation in the various sections of Walmart. And I look back on it now and I realize that I've always been interested in environments, specific environments, a lot of times like uh, small town kind of environments because a Walmart, unfortunately now, is kind of the social hub of a small town. Everybody goes there and you know everyone, you stop, you say hi, you get caught up on what's going on. So a you know, 20 minute grocery uh, trip usually ends up taking about 45 minutes to an hour just because that's the social hub. But you know, when I was set up doing these things, I got to know the community. Um, Fulton is, is also a smallish place. Its population is around 12,000. So much larger than what I was used to, but I'd go and paint these things and um, the people at Walmart, they'd get used to seeing me and they'd set up those little caution cones around my easel legs so people wouldn't <laughs> bump into me and people would bring their kids when they knew I was gonna be there and they saw hair watch her and ask her questions about art. So it was just a neat way to kind of be in the community and, and uh, respond to a specific space. So after uh, I graduated with my BFA, I remember making the decision to apply for master's programs because I knew I didn't really have access to anything. My resources were limited. I knew I had a weakness in terms of like more of the conceptual um, development of my work and I was, I was interested in taking my career to the next step but I just, in the Midwest, I didn't think I'd have much opportunity to do it. So I went to uh, the University of North Texas. I got accepted here. I was really, really excited to come 
to a completely new experience. Uh, the Dallas-Fort Worth-Denton area was amazing for me. For its art community, I had access to museums uh, regularly. I could go to lectures. There were visiting artists coming in. But it also was something that complete me, completely threw me for a loop. I had never lived in any place that was bigger than 12,000. And there's like 36,000 people on campus alone, you know? So it really, really, uh, I'm not sure I was ready for that for many reasons um, to go right into graduate school. But I don't think I would have made progress if I had not. Looking back on it, uh, I was way, way too shy <laughs> to be in grad school at that time. I don't think I capitalized on all the things that were presented to me, but I was paying attention and I was learning. Uh, I was just doing it quietly. So I, was, I wish I could have gone back you know, and, and been a little bit more um, outgoing. But uh, it was great to have access to a thriving community, um, making progress for the first time. I was looking at tons and tons of art probably suffering from kind of paralysis by analysis. And I was doing some grad visits this morning. Um, and I was thinking, oh, I remember exactly how this felt. And like, oh, you're in the exact same place I was. Like, it's fine. Just know that, you know, look at as much work as you can. Think about it. Make as much work as you can. I really encourage you to make a ton. And what you're trying to do is just like work through all the ideas. It's, it's much more productive to make it and then assess it objectively than it is to think, well, what if I did that? Or maybe I won't do that. So it's like you're almost censoring yourself before you get there. So make it. You don't have to show it. You just have to make it. And then hopefully you make enough work that you get all your, your bad ideas out and you start kind of getting to something that's more meaningful for you. Maybe you're starting to get to your instincts about what's important to you and what kind of work resonates, what kind of topics resonate. Um, so you have that kind of uh, instinctual response. So I encourage you just to keep making, keep a solid and, and uh, regular studio practice. That's another thing that I think uh, kind of came from my golf days is just the practice side of it. You know, it's a habit. You have to go in and spend time. And if you have that routine, you don't have to worry about the brain capacity to get yourself to the studio. It's just something that you do. And then your brain can think about the creative problems to solve as opposed to like, well, should I go today? Well, maybe not. Or I could do this instead. You just show up. It's practice. You have to go. Um, so in hindsight, you know, as I'm thinking about my time and my first couple years of grad school, this was the very first piece that started what I'm doing now. And as you can see, I'm going to flip back to that. But I, I got to grad school, and I had no idea what I was doing. I wasn't ready for it. And so I just I relied on the things that I did know, which I'm a representational painter. I really love color. I love composition. I liked observational painting. I still do it a lot, just as practice plein air stuff. I like it. Uh, so I was making these still lives and painting from them in my studio space, but I knew they were hollow. I knew they weren't meaningful to me. It was just the process. Uh, and so I made enough of them, and they were pretty poor, that eventually I just I had to make something that responded to something I loved and to something that I missed, which was my hometown. And so I, I made this, and I wasn't even going to take it to critique. because It was just a piece that I, I did to make myself feel better. And I did, and I was, I was surprised at how much conversation this piece started. So I continued to develop it, and I, I realized that because I had removed myself from my home environment, I could start to see it and appreciate it in the way that I couldn't if I had never left Missouri. So way on into the future after this, it was actually after I moved back to Missouri for my current job, I realized all this work was about managing my homesickness. I didn't know that at that point. It took me many years to figure it out. Um, but I, I was starting to think about what made my experience different and what made me have more power to kind of like speak to in my work or address in my work. So this is the kind of the environment where I grew up. It was a very agrarian society. Like I spent a lot of time, you know, in livestock sales. My family has been, my mother's side is, we're farmers. Um, so working the land, being outside, talking about the weather, 
all of that stuff has made a big difference to me. And, and like I was saying, because we are farmers, you know, like everyone revolves around the farmer's almanac and the different kind of atmospheres, the different seasons, you're talking about your crops. So it's not just small talk, this is serious talk. And I think I grew up being aware of the weather and the atmosphere and that plays a major role in my paintings. So it's just an appreciation or kind of like, um, like sensibility, I think, because of my upbringing that brings something extra to my work and the way that I'm able to address it. So I you know, made various pieces. Um, some of them, this one was past graduation from grad school. But I had something like this that I remember specifically bringing to a critique. And people were looking at it. And someone in the class made a comment like, oh, wouldn't it be weird if people did hang deer from trees? And so I thought, OK. So I have some sort of um, you know, perspective that is almost exotic when it's seen in uh, a city setting. So it gave me much more of like a power of looking at my hometown and being able to use it in a very specific intentional way, again, that I wouldn't necessarily realize was different unless I'd left that environment. So I do occasionally do some daytime scenes. Every once in a while, people are like, do you ever do day? Uh, so I have experimented with it in the past, but uh, I, I tend to like the nocturne for a couple reasons that I'll talk about. Um, so I'm going to jump around a little bit now and, and talk in more in terms of categories as opposed to chrono uh, chronology. But I wanted to talk about um, how it's important to continue to think about networking, continue to think about how you can gain perspective in your own practice or otherwise. So something that's been important to me is participating in artist residencies. This was my first foray into it. It was actually between my second and third year of grad school. And I applied to be a studio assistant at Aramont School of Art and Craft in Gatlinburg, Tennessee. So I just got myself there for the summer and they put me up. All I had to do was work on the grounds and I did all kinds of things. I worked in the kitchen, I did landscaping, I ran errands, I took the garbage out, all the things. But for every week of work I did, I got to take a free workshop. It was really wonderful. It was like art camp on steroids, and I met really wonderful people that I still stay in touch with. You know, it was just a great um, first kind of realization that something like this exists. And I got to, to talk to artists from all over the country and all over the world as they were coming in to do the workshops. And I thought, wow, this is something that's out there that I might want to participate in. So as I was you know, a grad student here at UNT, 500X was a big deal. And so I know that 500X is still around, but it's not in the same building. Is that right? Yeah. So Jim Burton, actually, when I was first here as a grad student, you know, everybody would go to the openings uh, the first Saturday of the month or whatever it is. And, and Jim was like, hey, you, know, you should think about being a member at 500X. And I actually applied to have my thesis show there, and that's where it was. But after I graduated, I applied to be a member and uh, served there for a couple of years. And Jim said, oh, congratulations, because you've been a past member. <laughs> Whatever you do, don't take the treasurer position. <laughs> and uh, that's exactly what I have <laughs> happened to me. But it was, I learned so much doing that, and it really impacted me later in life. But it was so neat, again, to be able to network, to work with other artists with this goal of running the space. We got to see all kinds of work. It was a really neat place. Everyone kind of ended their nights on opening nights. So that was something that's super important to me all throughout my grad experience and afterwards as well. I remember one conversation actually in Vincent's class, one of the first classes I had here, and he was expressing how important it is to be supportive of your peers. You know, So whenever there's an opening and your friend has an opening, you need to go there and be there for them. And they'll do that for you in turn. If your professor has an opening, you need to go there and be there for them. And they'll do it in turn. So that has always been something I've cared deeply about, is supporting the other artists that I'm working around or working with. It's great to see art, yes. But be a support system for each other, for sure. So try and be involved. You know, like join co-ops, um, enter juried exhibitions, look for grants. All the things that will help you kind of like meet new people, interact with new people, 
I highly encourage you to do that. Volunteer if you have to, um, just see, see things, be a part of it. So now I'm gonna talk about, um, jump around, talk about studio spaces a little bit. So I moved out of my Oak Street Hall graduate studio space and it was one of the most traumatic experiences because I didn't even include an image of it because it was such a pit. Like I had so much work in there, it was piled up along the, the walls and it was just so difficult to extricate myself. Uh, but I moved out of that space and I, was, I stayed in Denton and I started to adjunct a little bit. Um, and I moved my studio into my one bedroom apartment and this is what it looked like. I put down, you know, like uh, drop cloths on the floor and paper on the walls and I built a, like a storage rack in the closet. So you just, you find a way to make it work, you know, was it ideal? No. But did it work for me and help me keep my practice going? Yes. And so it can be humble. It's all right if your space is humble to start out with. You just need to have a sacred space that is where you make your work. And that's the only thing you need to be doing in there, like nothing else. Don't let your coffee table be your, also your art table and also your dining room table. You need some sort of space that is just for your art making practice so that when you enter that space, it's part of your mentality too. So while you're transitioning out of your graduate experience or even your BFA experience, you know, there's things that you have to try and juggle. So you're trying to make financial ends meet, you're trying to manage your time and your energy, especially if you're coming out of an environment where there are due dates and where there's like critiques built in, all of that stuff goes away. So you have to be proactive to keep your momentum going, find a way to do that. So after I'd, I had graduated, you know, I, I really focused on trying to do some adjunct work, build my resume, I was trying to get different classes so my, uh, you know, my repertoire of what I could teach and the student at work examples out of those experiences was fairly broad. I thought that I wanted to go on and try and um, teach, you know, as, as my income. I knew I never wanted to use my art as my sole income basis because I just didn't want that pressure. I felt like it could affect uh, the kind of work that I wanted to make and was making. So I, I was trying to find another way to deal with my income. But, you know, I, a couple little things happened, fell into place. I got recommended um, f to the McMurtry Gallery in, in Houston and they invited me to be in like a new artist kind of summer show. Uh, and I got a, a solo show based on, on that uh, introductory show, I guess. Uh, from my thesis show at 500X, uh, a gallery that's no longer in Dallas, but Marty Walker Gallery, she uh, made an appointment with me to come see the work, and uh, she picked me up for representation. I had my first solo share, show there right out of grad school, and this was an image from it. It was 2009. Um, so those are some of the things that are kind of serendipitous. You have to work so hard. You have to be doing it in your studio. And you hope for just a little spark of luck here and there, but it, it won't happen unless you're putting the work in. You have to be ready to receive it when something does kind of fire like that. So um, on with the, the uh, residency um, kind of experiences that I've had, this was the first one that I applied to because I was still trying to transition out of losing that kind of constant feedback that comes from being a student, being surrounded by art, being surrounded by artists, so I thought, well, maybe I will pursue artist residencies more. And this was the first one I got into at the Vermont Studio Center. Um, obviously in Vermont. I did it in the summer of 2010. It was for a month. Uh, residencies, if you don't know, are a fantastic resource for artists. They provide time, space, funding, and networking opportunities. So for me, it's a really great way to continue my research as to what other regions of the United States feel like because I'm so focused on the rural Midwest. Like I told you, me moving to Texas was so, so profound for me to be able to understand my home better. So I thought I need to see other parts of the country to, to see how it's different or the same, to continue my understanding or see differences about my upbringing. So I went to the Northeast for Vermont and it was really fantastic. And in the bottom right, um, you know, this was, uh, we were in an old church. So this particular residency, there's like 40 or so artists there a month. 
um, and they have different buildings around their campus where they help set up a studio for you and depending on what your practice is. But this was the church group and that's because it was an old church. Uh, so we were church ladies. We just happened to all be women that month. And uh, we had, you know, we'd work all day and then we would kind of chit chat and, and uh, have social time at the end of the night. I'm still friends with all of those people and stay in regular contact with them. So, I mean, that was, you know, over, over 10 years ago. But a super important, it's like when you're together with people for that long, you can't help but form bonds, you know? So I've been so appreciative of, the, of those over the years. The next one that I did was in 2013, and I'm jumping around, uh, but keeping in the topic of residencies. But it was in UCross, UCross Artist Residency in Wyoming. And it was right up my alley because it was about as rural Wyoming as you could get. It was in a town of 60, so that was perfect for me. Uh, it was on an old ranch. They had beautiful grounds, but I had never really seen landscape like this. And the structures were so different. The yards were so different just because of the weather that they have there. So I like to try and drive to residencies so I can take all the materials and supplies that I want, not have to worry about shipping wet paintings and whatnot. Uh, but I also have my car there so I can explore the area. It's so nice to be there for a month because then you can get situated and, and have time to make your work but also explore while you're there. But this one by far was my favorite. I encourage everyone to apply to this. It was the Willapa Bay Artist in Residence in Oysterville, Washington. Also drove there, took three full days of driving, but so worth it. I got to see the country as I went. I got to take kind of the blue highways on my way there, see the small towns. Um, I will say there are parts of Oregon that are more remote than even I am comfortable with. <laughs> but it was beautiful. And so each of the artists, there were six people there that month. This one was fully funded. I paid nothing. Um, they gave us tiny cabins of our own, like private tiny cabins and freestanding artist studio for the visual artists. They were, it was in the woods, it was on this little peninsula, it was just gorgeous. And the studio on the bottom, as you can see, uh, had this really interesting kind of light that diffused the light as it was coming in. It was just so comfortable and amazing to work on. I'd never been the, to the Pacific Northwest. The top left images are the freestanding studios the visual artists had, mine was on the right. And there was a little common area, like the fire pit, we would hang out around there in the evenings. I uh, got to walk up the bay. I'd usually take like a studio break in the afternoon. I'd walk up the bay and then come back down on the ocean side. It was amazing. I uh, had never seen flora and fauna like that before. So again, just like having an uh, access to kind of an area that I wouldn't probably otherwise, especially for that long. Plus, there was a chef there that was just like five star. She would bring lunch to us to our studio door, knock on the door, drop it off over on the left, and then. Because we were in Washington, you know, we got uh, fresh oysters and she, she would send us down in the afternoon to look for Oyster Dan. She's like, oh yeah, just wander down there and see if you can find a guy in hip waders and see if you can get some fresh oysters for our dinner tonight. So we did and it was fantastic. I never had one of those. Oh, it was beet hummus. Yeah. I know, isn't it great? So being a Missourian, you don't eat oysters raw, don't do that. <laughs> but being on Washington, it was fantastic. Uh, the next one was Millet Colony for the Arts in New York. Uh, I did that in 2016, and each residency experience I've had has been really notable for various reasons. For this one, the group of people that were there, another one that was fully funded, had a chef, six people there in total, but we really hit it off. It was just like, I, in fact, I just had an exhibition open in San Francisco last week, and the gal over on the bottom left of that picture, she lives in San Francisco and came out to my opening and we got to hang out. So it's just like the bonds that you have at these residencies, they're just so meaningful because it's, it's just a unique time. Uh, being in New York, um, it was a remote part of New York. It was in Austerlitz. And I had never been to New York City before, so I took that opportunity to go into the city, took the train in, you know, it was just a really neat time to be in that part of the country. Most recently, my last re residency was in uh, Key West, Florida. I had my first sabbatical in the spring of 2020. So an unusual time. I did not see that whole scenario coming, who could have? But this residency was from mid-February to mid-March. 
So everything was just shutting down as this was ending. I drove to Key West. Um, so if you've not done that before, there's a seven mile bridge over the ocean to get to that last island. And the last few days that I was down there, there was a question as to whether they were going to close the bridge to like keep people settled, you know? So I was almost trapped in paradise. Uh, but my studio that I was assigned was almost a tree house. This is what it looked like as I walked outside the door. It was on the second floor of this big building that had a beautiful courtyard and this tree that came up through the center. It was amazing. We also took the opportunity, there were three of us there that month, to go see things that were Key West. So we took a ferry to uh, the Dry Tortugas. Has anyone been there? It's awesome, I highly recommend it. It's a Civil War era fort in the middle of the ocean, basically. But the architecture in Key West, well, I've never seen anything like it. You know, very, very different from the Midwest. Uh, the colors and things I'm responding to, this was actually from my time on uh, the Pacific Northwest, but I made a whole body of work in response to uh, what I saw in Key West. Uh, that's generally what I do. I take work with me to the residencies to work on while I'm there, but I use that time to explore those regions. I do some plein air work, I sketch, I take resource imagery, and then maybe when I get back to my home studio, I respond to it, make bodies of work, and actually, I got a review in the Art Forum for that show that I had um, in Los Angeles and that came from my Key West experience. So I was pretty pumped about that. It's still online, so you can read it now. <laughs> so let me go through a little bit of my progression now. Um, just after I told you how important artist residencies have been for me, there's over 500 of them estimated in the United States. Um, there's more than 30,000 artists that are provided residencies each year. Tons of funding out there, over $40 million. They're really easy to search for. There's like Alliance for the Artists. Arts, I think, is a really good website. There's several. So uh, I'm sure your professors can direct you to them, and I'd be happy to as well if you have questions. Um, so moving on, I just wanted to talk to you about how my work has progressed over the years and how I'm thinking about it conceptually. Um, this is when I was still living in Texas. And like I've told you, it took my move for me to really understand my home and start making work about it. It was initially, I was thinking about it in a removed way. Because when I was living in Texas, I'd only get back to Missouri maybe twice a year. And I'd be driving, it was like 10 hour drive. Um, so not often. So I was thinking about it in a removed way and I was thinking about more of like the industrial buildings kind of as a whole, the, the sort of structures that existed there that I thought were very different than what I was seeing in Texas. I was playing with the idea of, of how to elevate these really mundane structures that I thought were beautiful. You know, like the things that I would pass on a day-to-day -day basis living in Brookfield, like I thought they were gorgeous. And I'm sure that not many other people did. So I was trying to paint them in such a manner that I could really express how much I cared for these locations and how much I realized they're different than people living in Dallas or Fort Worth might think. I was thinking about the layers of history that structures could hold, but also started to question, is there another way I could show that? So for a little while I had a focus on even pavement or parking lots, you know, because things that have been there for a long time you know, they, are, they show their wear and tear in specific ways, and I liked the idea of trying to take the structure completely out of it, and for a while it almost got like almost, almost abstract in a way. So in 2012, I was hired at Missouri State University, and I moved back to my home state, very different portion of the state. The geography looks really different to me. Um, much more used to what I'm used to than Texas, though. So, but I was driving home from work through neighborhoods and I started noticing, it took me a while for it to occur to me, that I was addressing residential structures more than the industrial structures that I had initially been making in Texas. So it started to become an investigation of more of like an identity, a specific identity as, a, as opposed to the identity of like a, an actual town or like the system of whatever kind of commerce goes on there. And then, you know, on down the road a little ways, I started to make these really playful, and this was like a really odd thing that I did, but had a whole series of blanket fort paintings because I was thinking about structure in a very different way, in a very kind of like 
whimsical way, because what kid didn't build a blanket for it, right? So I made a whole body of work based on that. It was kind of just a fun off to the side project that I got invested in. So I made actually a lot of these. And then most currently, and this is like a huge condensed snapshot of what I'm doing. You know, I, you can see on my website, you know, I, I probably need to update it, but you can see a lot more of my work. But this is where I am now. So first, I was separated from my home by distance. Now I'm realizing I'm separated from my home by time. So whenever I go back to where my hometown is, my parents still live there. I have a lot of family still there. But I'm starting to notice that it almost feels foreign to me because I've been gone so long, there are certain landmark buildings or structures or even like trees that have either fallen in, fallen down, been bulldozed down. I'm almost feeling more of like a visitor now. And there's certain things I'm realizing about my home that just seem in contrast to how I remember it. So I'm trying to parse that and figure out a way for it to come through in my paintings. And a lot of times it's through some sort of fence or some sort of like um, structure that separates or even like placing myself um, in a more removed way, getting more of the environment, like multiple houses as opposed to a specific portrait of a house. So that's kind of where I am now. Um, now I'm going to backtrack and talk a little bit about my professional experience with higher education and how that all came into to play here. Well, I told you I was doing some adjunct work and the thing about it is you you, it's hard to land one of those tenure track jobs. They're really competitive. There are not very many of them available. But if it's something that you're interested in and care about, pursue it. It just may take some time. I remember some advice when I was starting down that path is you have to have at least three to five years of adjunct work under your belt before you even get a sniff when you're applying. And that was true for me. So uh, in 2012, up to that point, I'd been adjuncting. I was adjuncting at three places. So I was teaching at UNT, at Austin College up in Sherman, and uh, Brookhaven Community College. And I had a weekend job. So I was working seven days a week and painting on, in the evenings. You can do that for a little while. You can't sustain that long term. And I knew that. And so I was kind of right at the end. And when I graduated in 2009, there was a big recession. So things were kind of precarious. Uh, everybody was looking for a little bit more job security. Some of the adjuncts were not being hired back. So that's when I really started to think about pursuing a tenure track position. And I applied everywhere. I applied all, all across the United States. I was just hoping for anything. Um, just so happened I got my first interview at Missouri State University and ended up back in my hometown. So it worked out perfectly for me. And it feels awesome to be back you know, in my home state, closer to family, that makes a difference in an environment that I recognize and feel comfortable in and that I love. So it just, it feels good. Missouri State University is actually a pretty large university. We have 27 faculty, we have over 500 undergrad students. I run the MFA program. It's um, a fairly new program. We have 17 students this, this year, so we're growing. Uh, but our buildings, interestingly, I was telling Laurie about it earlier, they're in old ice packing plants that they've converted. So they're off the main campus, but close to the downtown. So our students are able to walk to all the little galleries around town. And it just has its own kind of environment about it. And as you can see, this is our painting studio. It just has a lot of character. So the studio progression that I've had, um, I moved to Springfield. And that was when there was like that weird housing bubble situation. So I was able to buy a small home. And I moved my one bedroom apartment studio into a bedroom at this house. So it actually kind of set up in a very similar way. It was about the same size and it was interestingly the same layout. I was able to put a shop in my garage so I didn't have to lug my miter saw and all my stuff out to like a driveway somewhere and do it on the ground. So that felt awesome, really enjoyed that. Um, but most recently, I received tenure at Missouri State, and I moved to a new house that had a three-car garage, and this is the studio I have now. So it took me over 10 years to get to a studio that I feel really suits my needs and has space. I was able to design it in such a way 
So that back wall with the, the lights, that's actually the garage door. So from the outside of the house, it looks like a garage, but on the inside, we built a false wall in front of it, took out all the mechanics that would raise the door. We could reestablish re it and reinstall it if necessary. I put a floating floor in. Um, I built a dividing wall over on the right. Um, just beyond that is the other side of the garage, so there's still a place for me to park my car, and that's where I do all my woodworking, like cutting panels and such, to keep the dust out. Um, I've got over on the back right corner, you can see that's where my easel is, but I have a heavy duty vent over that, and I also have an air purifier that I recently added to this space. So trying to protect my health a little bit better, much better lighting. I have a studio sink now that I can just destroy, and it's no longer my kitchen sink, so I'm really happy about that. Um, so yeah, it just it fits my needs. It has much more space. It, it's just a very good upgrade for me. So I'm, I'm proud of this, <laughs> that I've been able to move it to this kind of scenario. It took a long time, so give yourself that time to get there. Uh, so let me now talk about uh, where I am in the moment with my own work. You know, I've kind of given you a little bit of an indication, but this is pretty recent stuff in the last couple of years. Um, I am more and more aware as I go home that I'm a visitor, but also how the industry is drying up. So our main street, every time I go home, there's another building that's empty, you know? And so without economy, a town, you know, can't exist. So I made a body of work um, that was shown in Houston last May about my main street. So this was the first time that I had um, designed a show to fit in a, a space in a specific way. So all the pieces were the same height, so they kind of symbolized going down Main Street, and they kind of covered all those um, buildings that I remember as a kid that had grocery stores or tailors or clothing stores or hardware stores, any of that, that are now empty. And then on the other walls in that space, they were kind of the littler, smaller buildings that you would encounter as you would either come into town or leave town you know, such as little places like this that used to be like a filling station or a bank. This was actually a, um, a bank. So it's just, it was a way for me to kind of address the specific town a little bit better in a, in a, in a more focused way, I guess. Uh, most recently, I, I just mentioned earlier that I had a show open in San Francisco last week, and this is one of the pieces that was there. Um, I'm really thinking about how removed I am from my town and, and I'm trying to take the decline of it, which it's really notable to me. You know, there's meth is a problem. Um, there's really no industry. So there's a lot of people that are struggling financially. Things are becoming run down. Buildings are being abandoned. But it's still beautiful to me somehow. So I'm really kind of kicking up my colors and I'm, I'm trying to, to save it somehow just through my painting. I don't, I don't even know what I'm trying to do, but it's, it's hopefully coming out. But really dramatic lights, colors. Um, I'm starting to work on more of like an oblong kind of format so I can get a bigger swath of the environment and how these, these little houses and structures fit together. I'm kind of interested or becoming interested in alleyways even more, like what people pile up in their alleyways, the kind of lights that happen. I want to also talk to you just about like how to find the balance. There's a lot that is expected of you on campus if you're working in higher education. It's really difficult, I think, to maintain a healthy relationship with that, balance your practice, but also make sure you replenish yourself and have hobbies and things that you do that keep you healthy mentally and physically and all the things. So I'm a crazy gardener. This is my garden. <laughs> I really love it. Um, for a long time, before I figured out how to build these fences, they all fold back. How about that? I know. I struggled with rabbits <laughs> and deer and groundhogs and squirrels and everything else. And then I took up archery. And so <laughs> I'll let you wonder how good a shot I am. But I really love to garden. Um, I grow a lot of my own food. I put up things for the winter. I make pesto out of anything that's green. I was telling Laurie earlier, if you're not making oregano pesto, you're missing out. You should make carrot top pesto, all the things. If it's green, you can make pesto out of it. 
So I've gotten much better over the years at figuring out what kinds of things are negotiable and what is non-negotiable for my usage of time. You know, like what do I need to do to satisfy what's expected of me on campus? What do I need to do in my studio? Um, and then what do I, I need to do for myself as a person? So those are your non-negotiables. And then the things around the side, it may be that you have to sacrifice some of those things. So being good with time management, being organized, all of those things play in, I think, to, to being a professional and making it all work. I've talked about how important it is to have a regular and focused studio practice, but I think it's also important to start developing your professionalism. So make sure that you're always courteous and professional when you're dealing with people in you know, the, your realm, like whether that's a gallery, maybe that's your professors, maybe that's people you're working with in a job that's you know, off campus somewhere, be supportive. I think a lot of times when you're trying to transition into gaining gallery representation, you're thinking about you know, trying to get a show. But it's important to be supportive of the whole system so I mentioned when I was a grad student, we would go to all the openings. We would be there for our friends. You're being there for the, the art scene. You have to go, and if you go regularly, they'll notice that. People will notice that. You'll be a regular face, a recognizable face, and that means something. That's very, that's very important. So be supportive of the gallery scenes, the art scenes, your peers, your professors. Um, you know, if you have the opportunity to have a show or you're contacted for something like that, be respectful, be prompt in your replies. Um, make sure that you're on time, that you do what's expected of you. Um, just hold yourself in, in the professional manner. There are so many things in the art world that you have no control over. You have no control over who is on a jury. You have no control over whether you're offered a show a lot of times, whether you receive a grant, whether you get into a residency program, whether you get a call back for a job. You are in control of your work ethic, and you are in control of your professionalism. Those things will pay off, but that is what you really ought to think about and I think focus on as you move through your career. Really be in control of the parts that you, you can have control over. So as a practicing artist, as a, you know, someone that's working in higher education, you have to also be fairly well versed in a lot of things. So if you don't like writing, start working on that. <laughs> you know? There's a lot of writing involved in this. If you're applying for a grant, if you're applying for a residency program, all of those things require good writing skills. And I forgot to tell you my trick. Uh, if anyone's interested in, in residencies, I'll tell you my secret. So you have to research the residency and figure out what it is about that place that's unique. And then you have to make your case in your proposal, in your writing, as to why you specifically, with the work you are making, would benefit from that experience and why you must be awarded that residency. So find a way. It's always like, you're, it's like an argu argumentative kind of writing. You meet, need to make your case, evidence, and follow it up. Okay. Also, I mentioned a bunch today, time management and organization. But there's things beyond that. You need to have good financial skills. You need to be able to do your taxes. You need to be able to understand contracts and legal documents. You need to be able to plan for your future and understand what kind of decision making goes into that. You need to be able to promote yourself, find applications, fill them out. It's all challenging, but it's also so important to be engaged in this way. So as you go forward, I have a couple of things uh, that I think I would like to leave you with. You know, and uh, there'll be some time, I think, for questions after this. But as you're transitioning out of your experience as a student, whether that's BFA or MFA, I encourage you to visualize what your goals are for short term. So think about where you want to be, what you want to be doing in one year, two years but also five years and 10 years down the line. And that can be really challenging because who knows what you'll be doing in 10 years. But you really need to think about it. And the way you can start to formalize those ideas is 
figure out what you want. Like, what kind of geography do you want to live in? Do you want to live in a city? Do you want to live somewhere rural? Do you want to live somewhere abroad? Do you need to live by family and friends? Also, like, what kind of income is it going to take for you to live the way you want to live? Are you happy living in a one-bedroom apartment? Is that good for you? Awesome. Do you need something more than that? Do you need to be able to travel? That's expensive. You'll need to be able to find some kind of salary and some kind of job that will help you live that way. Also, what are your career goals? So what kinds of things do you want to accomplish and at what kind of time frame? And if you're totally stumped by that, I highly recommend you reverse engineer somebody that you admire. So find a mentor. I have been so, so fortunate over the years to have mentors that have helped me in profound ways. And several of them are sitting in this classroom. So I will be forever grateful for you. In the art world, it's so hard to reciprocate that help. So what I try to do, generally it's really hard to reciprocate because people that are helping you have maybe already established to some degree, so it's hard to give back to them, but you can pay it forward. So what I try to do is take that energy and the kindness that was shown to me and help people that are coming up underneath. So my students that I'm working with, you know, I try to be a mentor for them and try to help them in ways that were really important for me too. So be thoughtful and kind in that way if you can. Um, reverse engineer. So look at somebody in your life, whether it's a mentor or somebody that you admire in the art world, and find their resume. Look at what they've done. Figure out whether they've gotten grants, figure out whether they've done residencies, figure out what kind of education they've gotten. Did they do extra workshops? What things have they had experience in that have helped them get to where they are? And start looking for opportunities for you to do that for yourself. What are you going to have to engage in? and look specifically at the time frame. I think one thing that is so difficult about our culture right now is that on social media, you see things and it looks like everyone is succeeding and thriving and it's happening overnight. That is not realistic. So remember that it could take 10 to 20 years for you to achieve some of these goals. But if you have a year-by-year -year breakdown that will help you stay on track and help you make progress, it's quantifiable. You can always kind of get your bearings and, and think about whether you're making progress. And if you're not hitting them, you can look at the reasons maybe why you're not, or you can revert, you know, kind of adjust your, your path and move forward in that way. So really think about that. I would also encourage you to think about your financial literacy. And I know that's something that maybe doesn't fit right into the arts field. But it's so important. And I'm going to give you a couple things to think about here in a minute. Um, but just know that uh, saving for your future is important for you to start doing now. Also, uh, using professional, professionals when it's necessary. In my opinion, everybody needs an accountant, an attorney, and an insurance agent. So try and put yourself in some position where you can use those professionals. Am I running out of time? Can I keep going? OK, I'll speed it up. I'm almost done. This is like my second to last slide. So if you have to go, thank you so much for coming. So if you take nothing else from my lecture today, everybody needs to go and start a Roth IRA, OK? You need to do that. I'm going to run through these very, very quickly. Um, but if you don't have an accountant, you need one. They can help you with your taxes. You're not dentists. You don't do your dental work yourself. You're not an accountant. Don't do that either. And so if you don't have a degree in this stuff, what you could do is look at YouTube videos and try and figure it out yourself. But what will happen is inevitably you'll probably do it wrong. And then you're either going to run into more trouble or it's gonna, you're going to have to hire a uh, professional to undo what you've done. And it will take more money in the end than if you had just hired someone to help you do it correctly the first time. So get an accountant and talk to them about starting a Roth IRA, potentially a traditional IRA. In a nutshell, a traditional IRA is a tax-deferred account into which you can put money tax-free. So there are various things about it, you know, like rules and regulations you can talk to about with your accountant. A Roth IRA is similar, 
but it has some more exceptions. So the contri contributions that you make have been taxed already, but the earnings on the account accumulate tax-free, and when you withdraw from this account, you pay no income tax, and there is no mandatory withdrawal. So with a traditional IRA, you have to start taking it out when you're 51 and a half, or 59 and a half, sorry. So with a Roth IRA, you could potentially put into it and even think about providing for your heirs, you know, on down the line. Uh, if you happen to work for some kind of company that offers deferred compensation, that might be like in the form of a 401k, a 457b, or a 403b account. Those are really excellent because like a, a Roth IRA, you don't pay taxes on it when it goes in, and you accumulate tax-free uh, tax and pay tax when it comes out. So the idea of compound interest, if you don't know that or understand that, look into it now. The earlier you start, the bigger the impact it can make. So start thinking about your, your future, your financial future. There, you can't start it too early. It takes as little as $200 to start a Roth IRA. So get yourself to some kind of banker, loan agent, you know, like Edward de Jones, something like that. Preferably somebody that you trust. If you don't know where to start, go to your bank and ask for you know, recommendations. Talk to friends or family or parents or somebody that you rely on and ask for a recommendation in that way. But it's so, so important. You need to start taking and keeping good records too. So if you have to do your taxes as an artist, there are certain things you can write off. If you Google like IRS, what you can write off for your practice, if you have um, declared that your intention is to make money from your practice and it's not just a hobby, a hobby, you can write off a whole bunch of stuff and there's an itemized list of that that you can find online. So another reason to hire an accountant, they can help you save money. Um, when you're thinking about insurance, I really, I really feel strongly about insurance. So the, the types you may need would be renters, homeowners insurance, uh, pi public liability insurance, so it protects you about against any kind of public uh, mishap or injury that could happen, because accidents happen. Health insurance, I really believe in. So you're hoping that nothing does happen, but if an accident happens and you need coverage, it could be something that saves your life, you know, financially for sure. Disability insurance, auto insurance, I'm really kind of condensing all this, but I can talk to you about it further on if you need it. And then finally, an attorney. So a lot of you have probably already signed contracts. If you live in an apartment, you probably already signed one. But if you're thinking about working with a gallery on down the line, that is a legally binding document that outlines everyone's uh, agreements and terms of, or conditions of working together. So it's a vital, vital document. You need to know and understand what it says and it needs to leave no loopholes because that is one way that you can be protected. It also shows you're professional and ensures that you'll have a potentially a great relationship long term. In the arts, you're hopefully in it for long term things and not just like quick immediate stuff. You want to build relationships that will last um, and be professional while you're doing it. If you sign some document and you don't understand the wording, then it's a legally binding document. You know, and then you're kind of out of luck. So you need to understand the, it, how it's written if you don't hire someone that can help you. And I can talk more about this once we kind of get through the question and answer if you want. So I think that's, that's what I have to tell you. <laughs> Thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate your time. <laughs>